Alright, okay, uh, I guess that's most of the show are here now. Uh, today, Professor Mutu is in, uh, in town, so I'll be giving a lecture on virtual memory. And the slides will be from, uh, I'm, I'm gonna borrow like material from Warner and also like Pierre C.A. Justin Mesa and Yungu Kim. And I have some announcement. Uh, Lab 3 is due next Friday, actually. Wait, was that next, next Wednesday? Yeah, that, that, that was very... I was like, no. <laughs> the, the date is right, uh, fri Friday 20, uh, 21st. <laughs> but that is Friday. Uh, homework 3 is out. It's gonna be about the same length as the homework 2. So be prepared that it's gonna be a little long. But it should be a good practice for a midterm which will come a week after that. And another like minor announcement is uh, next week, as I promised you guys that I'll be doing a conclusion on some of those, uh, mo most of the required paper and present it during the presentation, which is the lab section. So I'm gonna distribute it to all the TAs we have and Varun is gonna cover all of those on Tuesday lab. I'll do the Thursday lab and then either uh, Paraj or Xiao will do the Friday lab. So if you if you haven't done the reading, uh, or you would like to get a conclusion on what uh, those reading uh, goals and what are the problems they are trying to tackle and what are the major findings, uh, please attend the lecture, uh, the, the recitation. Great, yeah. uh, would you be able to make a piazza post about that? I will, I will. And the other thing is for those who haven't had in the, the diagram for lab two, I'm gonna make a lab two diagram folder in the hand-in folder because right now the lab two folder is locked, so no one can actually put anything in into the lab two folder. I'm gonna make another separate folder so I can submit the diagram. And for the check off, please make sure you have the diagram ready, either opening up on your laptop or have it printed out. And today, Friday would be, I guess, the last day that we can do the check off, unless you have a like major reason why you cannot make it this week for lab two, and we'll try to make that. We'll try to grade lab two as fast as possible, and we'll uh, send you guys the feedback on what uh, particular cases or tests uh, that you fail, <coughs> so that you can make sure for lab three it doesn't get propagated to the same uh, errors again, and like so you can focus on the pipelining part of the lab three. All right. Uh, so let's go over the virtual memory and what are the problems of using just the physical memory. In, in the programmer's part of view, when you program something and you would like to use a memory, here's what the programmer see. When you are writing something in assembly or something in the, in the C code, you, when you deal with memory, you do one of the two things. You store some data in the memory and use that later or like write them in a file. Or you can load some data from a file or some location in memory and get that data so that you can do some computation later. And ideally, what we want for this memory to be is we have we would like them to have a zero access time, which means whenever we want to grab this particular data from memory, it should arrive right away. It should have infinite cap uh, capacity, which means that we can store as much data as we want uh, at any time and we will never run out of memory. And it should be zero cost. I would, ideally, I wouldn't like to buy uh, like a lot of VRAM for my machine. And lastly, I would like to have a, in, uh, the memory to be have to have the infinite bandwidth so that I can support multiple access in parallel. For example, if I, have, if I have a parallel code and I would like to access 10 memory locations at the same time, I should be able to do that. But as you guys can imagine, what what these are ideal and are not true in the real world because memory incurs some cost. The faster one, they are more costly, but and also smaller. As in, you cannot have a like one gigabyte of SRAM because they are too costly comparing to DRAM. And here's the how the the modern memory hierarchy looks like. Uh, you have a the tiny amount of register file, which is the fastest memory. 
on most machines, this spans 16 or 32 entries that can store a word. So in, in, in all, you can store 32 words. And the access latency for this virtual file is usually, say, one cycle or sub uh, nanosecond. And in addition to that, this virtual file can be managed manually through either through the compiler or you just write your assembly code that uh, deal with how you're gonna manage all these virtual files. After these layers, you have several layers of caching, which is the fast memory. These are SRAM uh, cells that are tiny but are faster than the usual uh, DRAM DIMMs that you can buy from the new egg. <coughs> uh, and after that, you have the actual main memory, which is the DRAM. And the size of the memory is typically in the gigabyte. So if you would, if your program, for example, operates on a terabyte of data, somehow you would like to make sure that virtually it, it can deal with all that terabyte of data with the latency or the access latency of around like 100 nanoseconds instead of having to access the disk, which are a lot, a, a lot more slower uh, than the main memory. And without the virtual memory, these are the example of how uh, you can lay out different addresses and how, how can you handle the access from the, the program. And can you guys give me some example of what are the potential problems of this model without the virtual memory? Yeah. Like some program can other override another program's memory location? Yeah, so security is one of the major problems because you, you, you have no way to control what particular segment of this uh, different pages that a particular process can access. So you can have three processes that doesn't have anything to do with each other trying to access the same location in memory and then it causes either malicious activity to the systems or it just causes fault and just render your, your system useless or trash. Uh, what are the other potential problems that can uh, occur in this particular setup? Yeah? You only run a finite amount of programs once your physical memory is done, like you start overlapping. Yes. And in addition to that, there's another problem called segmentation. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll show you what it means. Uh, for example, you have a program one, that, and here's the, the memory. And this is a contiguous uh, memory at the initialized state, so everything's free right now. And program one access, say, four blocks of memory. And then it, it performs some computation. And later say, oh, I don't really use this particular chunk of the memory anymore. So I free this. And as you can see now, we have like segmented memory. Even though these three uh, segments combined are uh, enough that another program say you want to use this much uh, memory space. Because it's segmented now, how, how, can, how are you going to allocate that particular block to the other uh, processes? So this problem is called segmentation. And virtual memory, which provide indirection, can solve this problem as well. And then <coughs> lastly, what are the, like, it's actually it's a simple uh, problem, but what are the other potential problems that can happen in here, in this case? Well, what, what, what are the ideal? Uh, uh, me uh, memory that we would like to have. We would like to have an infinite amount of capacity, right? So, but when you buy the, the, the memory, the DIMMs from uh, the retailer, you you don't have that. You you say you buy a four gigabyte DIMM and you plug it into your machine. Now your machine has only four gigabyte of main memory, but you would like to virtually make the program realize that oh, I actually can access more than four gigabyte. I can actually use one terabyte of data, and somehow there'll be a management unit that uh, manage this virtual, uh, virtual memory space and making sure I, I can run my program as if I have one terabyte of memory. 
So I'll list again what are the potential problems. First of all, is physical memory has a limited size, and the bigger the size that you would like the system to have, the more costlier your your system is. And what if you just need close to infinite memory? You 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 can potentially buy a system with like terabyte of memory, but that would cost a lot of, like of money, probably more than like thousands of dollars. <coughs> And the, the, the second concern is, should the programmer be concerned about the size of memory at all? Like, whether I, I initiate this block of memory, should I be concerned about whether it's gonna use more than the amount of the, the physical memory that I have or not? And then the next question is, should the programmer, the, the high-level programmer that just want to program that application, manage the data movement from disk to the physical memory? Because that's uh, another complicated uh, uh, algorithm that you have to perform in addition to just writing your own program. And the answer to these two problems is probably not. If I'm just want to write a, a program in Java, I probably don't want to like deal with all these issues. Also, in addition to this, ISA can have address space that are greater, way greater than the physical memory size. Say, all of the machine that you have right now probably use 64-bit address space. Those are way more than the for eight gigabyte uh, memory that you have on your machine. So <clears throat> it's the job of the management unit that manage the virtual memory to handle all these issues. So the basic mechanism of virtual memory is to provide some indirection. And what does it mean by indirection is uh, address that are generated by each program or each instructions in the program is called virtual address. And this virtual address is not really the address that you would like to use to actually access the data in, the, in your memory. And this virtual address is linear in the, in the programmer point of view. So you can uh, go through the virtual address in, in a linear manner. There's no segmentation within the virtual address space. And then you have the address translation layer. And if you took 213, and I, I, I guess most of you taken 213. It's required, right? Yeah, yeah it's required. I mean, that, that should, there may be some master students that might not take in this. That's why I'm going over this again. Uh, that, that, uh, that's uh, another additional address translation layer that manages the indirection <laughs> and map them, map the virtual address into the physical address, so you can actually locate what, where my data is in the actual physical memory. And this address translation layer uh, is being managed by uh, a unit called MMU, which is a mem memory management unit. <coughs> and this layer is, is being implemented in the hardware and software together. So it's, it is called a hardware software cooperated uh, uh, mechanism that you have some hardware that deals with the interaction and having this table and then the software program how are you going to define the interaction and mapping for from the virtual address to the physical address and here's like only one high level example of a machine with the virtual memory which is most of the machine probably all the machine that you use right now you have a CPU, and then you have the memory. These two, uh, those two units are similar to the machine with physical memory. But then you have this interaction layer that translate the virtual address using the uh, what we call the page table, which is simply a table that you can use the virtual address to look up where uh, where in in this memory space is actually the physical uh, page that we'd like to access. And you uh, this page table helps translating the virtual address into the physical address. <coughs> and as you can see, there, there can be two cases that, that can occur in these scenarios. First of all, if you would like to access some page in the memory, and the page table says, oh, it's over here in the memory, everything's fine. You just grab that page and process the data. But what if you would like to access this particular page, which doesn't exist in memory? 
this is something we call page fault. And if that's the case, you have to grab the data from the disk and and replace some page in the memory. And at the address translation layer, uh, first of all, we convert the virtual address into a physical address, and then the memory management unit also do uh, handles how the mapping also how how are you gonna replace page in the memory with the one from the disk when you when you fetch one. And now I'm gonna go over some uh, key terms that we, we will use uh, in this class and in general. So when we refer to pages, it means that you have a virtual address space which are which is a contiguous uh, linear space that each of the program sees. This virtual address space is divided into pages. But then if you refer to the frame, you know, now you're looking at the physical memory that you have in your machine, and then the physical address space is divided into frames. So there are pages that are associated with the virtual uh, world of each program, and there are frames that are actually the the physical memory that you have on, on your machine. <coughs> and then a virtual page is mapped into a physical frame. And in this case, we assume that the page is in memory because the, the, the frame are the physical addresses that lies in the memory. And then if you access the virtual page that are not, that is not in memory, but they are on the desk, Virtual memory systems have to bring the page into the physical frame and we we'll call that a demand paging. And then the page table, as I described earlier, is the table that stores the mapping of this virtual page into the physical frame. And now the next question is, what do we need in order to support VMs? Uh, any, any ideas? How, yeah. Well, you need a hardware translator, probably a, that sits in between the memory and the CPU. Yes. So first of all, you need to have a component, which we would call the MMU, that handles uh, how you're going to translate it, the virtual address to the uh, physical address. And then there are a lot of jobs for the software to leverage the MMU. <coughs> in particular, uh, they have to first populate the directories and the page table, which is, means that they have to define some mapping from the virtual address to the physical address. And then, uh, whenever you have a context switch, you have to modify the page directory, uh, the, the base res register, so that you co uh, point to the correct page directory. And as some of you pointed out, you, have, you can have some security issues and virtual memory can help supporting or protecting against these security issues. So one of the jobs that the software layer has to help the MMU is to set the correct permission for each of the processes, and we will go over this in, on, in the next lecture. And also, lastly, what do you have page fault? You have to define a way to manage the page fault. Also define like which pages in, inside the physical memory you would like to replace because you would like to replace the one that would uh, affect the system performance the, the, the least. And these are the additional jobs from the software side that we are not going to cover that in this class, but I would like to go uh, talk about them a little bit so that you're aware of how, how many jobs that the software has to manage for, in order for the MMU to not only be functionally correct, but performs well. Uh, it has to keep track of which physical page are free, and it also has to allocate the free physical pages to virtual pages. And then you have to make sure you replace the page that uh, <coughs> would, ha would have the, the least performance impact to the systems. And how, how are you going to handle like sharing between processes when, when they have share address? And these two are additional techniques that you can do in order to get better performance out of your system. This is copy and write optimization and also the page flip optimization.
And now I'm going to give you another example of what would happen when you have a page fault, which is you would like to access some page in a physical memory, but they're not there. And it's the job of the memory management unit to handle this case in order to uh, pretty much to grab the data from the disk and get it to the, the CPU that requests this page. So before the page fault, you have the CPU, page table, and memory, and you would like to access this particular page but they are not in the memory. First of all, you have to grab uh, the, the location of the page, the, the, the physical page in the page table, and the page table will have a valid set, then whether it's in the memory or not. In this case, they're not in memory, so you have to grab them from this. You have to generate first the page fault exception, and then OS will have a trap handler and this is this is now in the software layer that involves movement of data from this the disk back to memory. So after the fault, this particular page are now located somewhere in the memory, and you can access the page. Yeah. So just to clarify, the MMU doesn't do any of that. It just tells the OS that there is no. So it MMU throw exception. OS define how you you would like to handle the page fault. And then it tries again. Yeah, and, and can you guys give one example? What is what's the benefit of letting your OS handle this page fault? Yeah. Well, maybe like the OS knows exactly what all of memory should be used for. Yeah. So maybe it can choose how much to copy into memory. It can choose it can copy like a little bit, or if it'll be using a lot of that, it can copy the whole thing into memory. So you're talking about say you prefetch more data into the into the memory in case you would like to use them in the future. Yeah, like if you get a fault yeah. for like a specific address and yeah. you know what program it's coming from, yeah. you have to decide whether you just copy that like word or whether you're copying maybe ten words. Oh, so in general you actually copy the whole page. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So that that's usually the case. But you can actually copy more than that if you know uh, that you, you you have a program that loops, so you have a for loop that access a lot of data mm -hmm. that spans say four pages, and somehow you see that pattern and know that oh I will probably use the next three pages again. So one thing, one optimization you can do is which would be called prefetch, and this commonly done in the in the more more on the DRAM, but you fetch those data ahead of time because you are almost sure that you're likely to access them. So you yeah. don't incur four page fault. So in that case, you will incur one page fault. Yeah, and I think you are, well, okay. D yeah. Can you then define more clearly what a page is? Is it like all 32, like all, like an instance of all of memory, or is it a section of memory? Oh, it's, it's a section of memory, it's a block of memory. So for each machine, the page size is defined to be, say for example, four kilobytes, or something bigger than that. It, it's up to the mach uh, different machine how okay. they define the page size, mm -hmm. and there, there are trade-offs. If you have a bigger page, then you can, one thing that can be uh, uh, disadvantageous is you wasted bandwidth. It's possible you wasted bandwidth, because you, you fetch, say, four megabytes of data, but you actually use four kilobytes of them, and you wasted a lot of bandwidth. But then, what if you have tiny pages. Now you have to have a, a lot of bookkeeping or keep track of all the pages. Mm -hmm. So there are that trade-off between small pages and large pages. And we, we're gonna cover that a little bit later in, in the slides. But it only has, like mem physical memory only holds whole pages. It doesn't hold partial pages. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, other, the other things that OS, the OS has to handle is which across all the pages that are already in memory, which one you would like to pick? For example, what if you have no more free pages, but then you would like to get a page in the desk? You, you cannot just put, the, put them in here because they are not free. It's the job of the OS to figure out which page in the memory that you would like to evict. Because if you evict the one that would be used soon in the future, you're gonna incur a page fault again. And that that's a lot of latency you have to wait for because the the latency from, from
from getting the data in the disk, it's really, really high compared to uh, uh, the memory. It's like order of magnitude higher. So you would like to minimize number of page fault. In that case, one way you can do is you predict which block in the memory would be used the least or would probably never be used again and you evict that from the memory and then swap them with the one that you would like to access. <clears throat> so in order to service a page fault, I'm gonna have a separate diagram that shows the processor, the memory IO bus that connects the memory and uh, peripheral is on, on your uh, system that would be called the IO controller that connects the disk to the memory. So whenever you have a page fault, the processor signals the, the, the controller saying, oh, I have a page fault. I would like to read a block of length, say, P, at this address, X, and store them in the memory address, Y. So first of all, the, uh, the processor initiates the block read to the IO controller. IO controller read that block from the disk. And then the read occurs. And these data from the disk would be transferred from the I/O controller into the memory I/O bus, and then from the memory I/O bus to, uh, into the memory through the direct memory access. So, what what I mean by direct memory access? You don't have to go to like a processor to access the memory. And this is under the control of I/O controller. So you in this particular process, in some sense you copy the data from this, move them into memory so that you, it can be used from memory. And then afterward, after you're done copying the data from the memory, from this into the memory, the controller signals, the IO controller signal completion, saying, oh, I'm done. And then it's interrupt the processor, and then OS can resume uh, the, the, the process as if it's suspended because of this page fault. <coughs> But what if, what if you just run out of memory? What if you have a program that keep using all your memory, and then there's, you have another program that you, you would like to use, but you're running out of memory, you would like to access them. This can be called page swap. Uh, it, it happens when you're running on many programs. How, how many of you just run, for example, a Linux machine, uh, and then run some program that keep using memory more and more and more, and at some point, your machine slowed down, significantly to the point you can barely type in anything but it's still running yeah so many of you have done this before and I've done this before too so I write program and I actually have memory leaks so my program keeps keep using memory and then I'm trying to type like whim so I can edit another program I can barely use them and usually in most cases what happened in this scenario is you're running on memory and you have uh, you incur something called pitch swap uh, what happens here is you have a physical page that are being swapped out to the disk and as I mentioned earlier when you access something in the disk it's order of magnitude slower than accessing anything in the memory <coughs> so in this case a lot of your data are being migrated from the physical page into the disk and this free up those, those physical page and as a result uh, the, the page shuffle entry become invalid. And then uh, you brought the other page back into the memory. However, because you have two processes running, what happened is I have a process that has say memory leaks that keep using memory. I have another process that I'm actively using. I'm typing something in Vim. They have to use some memory. This process say, I will get more memory. I will access something and oh, they're not in the, the, the memory anymore because it gets swapped out. So I have to access something in the disk. And you grab that data, put it back in the memory, you swap other things that are likely to be my WIM process that have some data on the disk, and now it got swapped back out to memory. And you have this ping-ponging effect between two processes that try to, uh, try to grab the data but most of the time they are in the disk because you had a lot of memory footprint and your performance 
your machine slow down significantly to the point you can barely do anything. And this is called page swapping, which is a ping ponging effect between uh, different processes. Now I'm gonna go into how you do the address translation, which is another important topic in virtual memory. So for this topic, I'm gonna explain how can you get physical address from the virtual address. And I guess because you guys have taken 213 before, most of you probably went over this like many, many, many times in 213, including 213 exam. And yeah, I see some fluff. <laughs> so the page size, as I told you, is specified by the ISA. So different machines have different page size. The back has 512 bytes. Uh, Today, modern machine, this can range from 4 kilobytes, 8 kilobytes, 2 gigabytes. Uh, that is a little large, but it's possible. Uh, you can have like small and large pages mixed together as, as well. What are the thread off between um, big and small page size? I'm gonna go over that in the next slide. <clears throat> and in, in addition to that, what are in the page table? The page table, first of all, has to somehow uh, store the information that where is this particular memory address is mapped in the, uh, in the physical address in the memory. And each of those entries is called page table entry. And then I'm going to go over what is actually in the page table entry. But first, let me go over what are the trade-offs between different page sites. If you have a large page size, uh, the benefit is you have you, you don't really need that many page table entries, and you can save memory space because you don't really need those uh, entries. And then, in addition to that, there can be fewer uh, TLB misses, which I'll go over TLB later in the next lecture, I believe, uh, which is another optimization on how can you grab the memory fast. But uh, keep in mind that if you have a large page size, you can have fewer TLB misses. And what, what, what are the disadvantages of large page size? Uh, anyone would like to? Yeah. So fewer pages fit in your physical memory. So it's yeah. probably easier to get thrashing if you run with multiple, like many programs at the same time or something. Yes, that's possible. You have an access pattern that touch, say, page number Each one page, yeah. a little bit, then then touch the page two a little bit. So you have a lot of you can first of all cost thrashing, and it's inefficient because you fetch a lot of data from the memory, but you use a tiny amount of it. So it can cause extra transfer to and from the disk. This wastes a lot of bandwidth and also reduces performance. And in addition, in addition to that, it can a uh, large page size can cause internal fragmentation which means that, say, I want one kilobyte, but somehow my page size is one gigabyte, so I have to allocate one gigabyte. It's a waste of space, and, uh, I mean, I kind of went over external fragmentation earlier, which is when you have segmented uh, address between process, you have, don't have enough space for the other process to initiate memory. And lastly, you cannot have any fine-grained permission, because every page size one gigabyte. If you want to say, let process one use this particular page, how are you gonna do finer grain uh, permission handling in this case? Now, on to the address translation. I'm gonna define some parameters that we use often in this class. And I think it's pretty common in other classes as well. Uh, P will refer to the page size, and the the small P would be the bit. How many bits is used in order to refer to the page size? And the page size would be two to the small P. And N would be the virtual address limit or the virtual address uh, space. And then the actual big N, the capital N, which is the actual word in virtual address would be denoted into the form of 2 to the n, which is number of bits to refer to the virtual address. <coughs> and then uh, the small m would be the physical address limit, similarly to the virtual address, but this refers to the physical address. And given that, 
when you have a virtual address, some parts of those bits would be used in order to uh, refer where in the page table entries are those physical pages. And then some of those bits would be used for the offset. And in order to calculate that, suppose you know that if your page size is, say, 2 to 12 bytes, that means that your offset, which should be denoted in this form 2 to the p, the offset would be from bit 0 to bit p minus 1, because that, that's the amount of uh, indexing that you need in order to, when you grab a page, you know which particular virtual address within that page that you would like to grab the data from. The next information that you need is where in the page table entries that you have to grab the actual physical page number from because the page table entries stores the information of where that particular page is. In this case, <coughs> because you know the virtual address size, you can infer that information and get the information what bits for you within the uh, virtual address is the virtual, ad uh, virtual page number. And this will be from the bit field n minus 1 up to p. And the address translation layers, which has the page table and entries, maps the virtual page number. So the virtual page number becomes the index. Which becomes the index of the You use the virtual page number to locate where in this table is the, the actual physical page number. Suppose this in this entry, uh, you would have the virtual page number, and you would compare the virtual page number throughout this table to see whether it's matched or not. If it's matched, it means that this number is the physical page number. And then you concatenate the page offset, which is the same from the virtual address to the physical address, into this particular number. So this would be physical page number that we can get from this uh, PTE table. And then you concatenate the page offset in order to get the actual physical address. And once you have physical address, you know where exactly in the memory that you have grabbed the data from. <coughs> and note that the page offset bits is the same from the virtual address into the physical address. And the MMU, which handles address translation, handles how you can transform the virtual page number into physical page number. So, First of all, this address translation layer also separates each page table for each different processes. And then the virtual page number forms the index into the page table, which I described over here. The page table entries provide this information about where the page are. So you have, normally you have, say for each of the process, you have the page table base register that tells where this table, this, this whole table is located at. And then uh, you have the page table that uh, lets you translate the, the virtual, <coughs> virtual page number into the physical page number. And then you concatenate that uh, with the page offset to get the physical address. But there are other information that you need in the in the physical, uh, <coughs> in the page table entry. And the reason for that is that you can handle some permission 
with your different processes. And also you can handle uh, whether it's a page fault or not. And if the, 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 in order to handle whether you have a page fault or not, you have a valid list. Whenever the data is no longer in the memory, this valid bit will be set to zero. So even though you have some entries in here, if this valid bit is zero, it means that you have page fault. So if you if this bit is set to zero and you try to translate this physical page number and get the data from memory, it's not the data you would like to access anymore. And what you have to do in this case is you have page fault and you grab the data from this, move it to your memory, and then actually accessing that data in memory. And afterwards, suppose this valid bit is one, you can access the, the physical address using the virtual page number, index into this table, get physical page number, as I described earlier, uh, uh, concatenate the offset, and you get a physical address. And here's uh, the bigger, higher level overview of uh, how this process is done. You have the CPU ship. So these, everything here is within your CPU, the, the chip. And then you have the cache and the memory, which most of the case, the memory is off chip. So the latency is actually higher. If you have a page hit, first of all, you send a virtual address to the MMU. MMU translate that and get the physical address. And because the valid bit is one, you get the physical address and grab the data from the cache and memory. But before that, let me ask you one question. Where does the page table entry uh, loca is located? Probably in the cache. Yes, so either that or in the memory. So, so in the next lecture, I'm gonna talk about one optimization which, we, uh, which is called a TLB, which cache this physical uh, page table, because if you look at how you search entries in here, if everything here is in the memory, you have to actually walk through all these indexes in order to find where this particular VPN is located at. And that can be a, a long uh, process, because you have to search, like you have to compare all these indexes, and that can cause a lot of latency. So first of all, you, you get the uh, <coughs> page table entry and look it up in the cache of memory, depending on where that's located at, and then you grab the 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 page table entry, translate the uh, the virtual address into the physical address. Go back to memory again, grab the, the that physical uh, physical ad, uh, physical address, physical memory. Send, it, send the actual data back to the process so you can actually process the particular chunk of memory. However, what if you have page fault? Now, when you have a page fault, your, the, the whole process is more complicated because first, you have to send the virtual address to the MMU. MMU access the cache and all the memory in order to look up that table, and then when you look it up, say, oh, it's invalid. Is a page fault. I have to grab the data from from the disk. So first of all, you have to send the page PT address to the cache, get the page table sent back to the MMU so that you can see where it's valid or invalid. And because it's invalid, MMU send an exception so that you can have the page fault handler that allows the I/O uh, unit to access data to the disk. So when that happens, suppose the memory is full, the next thing you have to do is you have to infect something in your physical address, your physical memory back to the disk. So this, in this process, the OS somehow specifies which particular page if you would like to infect that to the, uh, to the disk. And then you grab the, the page you would like to access, put them back in the cache. And now <coughs> the handle will return and because the new page is already in the memory, you can set that, send it back to the cluster and continue its own process. And as you can see, how many, how many data? Compared to this case, uh, 
how many data accesses in addition that you have to grab? In this case, you first you have to grab some data from the M from the cache into the MMU. So that's one, and that's accessing to the memory. So you have First of all, you have to grab the data from the cache of memory. One page table entry is sent back to the, the MMU. And then you. Oh, okay. So the first one is not, not actually like sending the anything, you send the address to the memory. So you grab the data back, uh, the data from memory, you send a physical address, you grab the actual data to the process. So you have essentially two memory accesses to the memory or cache. In this case, you have the same process. You send the page table entry address, you grab the actual page table entry. So you have one memory access now. It's not valid, you send exception. You grab the page from the disk, and you also have to evict something from the memory into the disk. So you have to transfer from and to the disk. And then once you have that, you you now can get the virtual address and do the same process in order to grab that particular page in the memory. So you have two additional memory requests or, or data transfer from to and from memory. So as you can see here, you have one additional memory access, two additional disk accesses, and as I said, the disk accesses is uh order of magnitude longer than the memory access. So when you, whenever you have a page fault, you have to wait a really long time compared to when you have a page hit. All right, let me take a break over here uh, right now, and I'm gonna cover like multi-level uh, page table afterward. Let me go back to the slides and continue on. So what are the issues of, what are the po are possible issues that you have to think about when you design the virtual memory and this page table entry and memory management unit? Let me erase this because I have to use it later. <coughs> First of all, how large is the page table? Because page table is stored in the memory, so it actually uses the memory space. If you have them too big, now you don't have space to store your actual data. And where do we store it? In hardware, in the physical memory, or in the virtual memory? It's also possible to store a page table in the virtual memory. And then, regarding that, where do we store it? How can we store it efficiently without requiring that physical memory uh, store can store all the page tables. One way you can tackle that, and also this is being implemented in many, many modern processors, is to use multi-level page table. Conceptually, they are the same as single-level page table, but now you have several interactions. So you can have more uh, virtual address space without requiring multiple, uh, it requires multiple page, page tables, but you don't require the same amount of space that you need in order to, uh, to support uh, that many virtual address space <coughs> to store the page table. <coughs> and in this case, only the first level of page table has to be in the physical memory. The rest can be stored in the uh, <coughs> virtual memory. And the remaining, well, even though they are 
the rest of the 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 level in the pixel, even though they are in the virtual memory, they can be cached in the physical memory when they are being accessed, so that it can be faster when you want to access them. Because if you have multiple levels, the first one is in the physical memory. What if the other one is in the disk? <laughs> so in order to get the virtual address, you have to access multiple. You have to go multiple times to the disk in order to access that, and that can be really, really long. <coughs> And this is one of the possible scenarios. You have a single bits machine, and you only want to use one level uh, page table entry. You have a VPN that is 52 bit long, that contains a page table, and then you have a page offset, say 12 bit long. Uh, suppose that <coughs> this is your system. How how big would the page table be? That is. 2 to the 52 entry multiplied by 4 bytes per each entry. And that is like 16 times 10 to the 15 bytes. And that's just for one process. And you have multiple process in your, on your machine. Obviously, there's not the scalable solution. You only have something more scalable, and that's why you have to have. Uh, so that's why a lot of modern processors employ multi level page tables. And here's the High level concept of multiple level page table, and this for this done in the x86 ISA. You have the linear address spread, which is your virtual memory, the one that your program or your processes see. And this is a, con a contiguous block of memory. <coughs> this each of these entry can be trun uh, I mean, can be look uh, can be accessed, and each of the entry you have directly the table. And the offset. So this is the two level page table. The bit views that six, uh, specifies directory is being used in order to grab uh, where in the of the it within the mem uh, virtual memory space is your page table that you would like to look at. So first of all, you look at the directory in order to get where the page table is. Afterward, you use the page table to index within the page table where is the page table entries that are located at in order to get the actual page in the physical memory. So this is the physical memory. And you append the offset with the page table entry to get the actual physical address. <coughs> and I mean this page mapping is uh, it's used for a uh, four byte pages. And the normal 32 bit physical address size. In the 64 bit machine, Intel <coughs> x86 actually use four level of indirection in order to access your uh, page. <coughs> so, regarding that, in details, how do we actually access the page table? what you want is uh, your physical address. So first of all, the page offset is the same. So one thing you can do uh, you just move the page offset. And wait for the rest of the information to be filled here. And that's your physical address. And the rest are being handled by the MMU. The first thing you need is where is the page table base register, which is this for the information. First of all, you have the directory uh, that can be used to index where is the page table in the page directory. So you have the page directory. You 
grab this information, how many, whatever number of bits they are, suppose it's say 12 bits, you look it up in the index. You compare each of these entries in the index. If they match, it means that this was this is matched with this one. It means that this little entry you can use to append to this table in order to search uh, where exactly is the page table entry. So you have the page table, which is a second level of interaction. You have the index. Similarly to your page structure, you have index. And also like the valid bit, yeah. Is there any particular reason why they can't, why they aren't ordered? Like why, why you have to have the index? Oh, uh, it's possible. You so mean why do we need the index? So that you don't have to look through it and try to match it, but just like, so once you know what the base is, yeah. you can like subtract that. And so first of all, you, you somehow you have to search whether the index match or not. So that, that's required because you'd have to know which entry in here. But that's what I'm saying. Like if you think about memory, yes, technically there is an implied index of one through whatever the maximum is. Yeah. But you can act address directly into it because of the address. So why can't you apply that same principle to this and have them ordered such that you don't have to look through all of them and compare? So what if you it becomes invalid, for example? Well and you can you have some other invalid. other virtual address requests. So then what's the point of the valid bit? The valid bit tells whether it's in or not in inside the that. But what if you replace that particular entry with something else? Oh, so the valid bit is for when it starts off, if they have to be zeroed out. Yes. Well, or, or when you evict them, and you have nothing else to replace. Suppose I just do free, okay. yeah. I, I'm out of and do free. Yeah. Those things should be zero. But do you, have, but you don't really have to like write for, or like, we, we, we like zero out that entry, it's just zero out the valid bit. Because that's a lot simpler. Okay. Yeah. But like what if you you place this entry and the the interaction changes? Yeah. Now you have to somehow manage the search like make make sure this is searchable. That's why you have to like walk through this table. Okay. So uh, now you have to search through the index in the page table. <clears throat> and you grab this information, append this information. Uh, look into this table. In order to get the uh, the physical page number, and then append it with this information to get the actual physical address. So, in the high level, this is almost similar to having one level page table entries, but you are able to just to, to have much, many more uh, space because this page directory allows you to have multiple page table. For each of the page table, you can uh, use to index into multiple location in your address space. So this, this is a much more scalable solution. And you can imagine what if you have 64-bit address space. Now you can have multiple directories uh, uh, across the 64 bits. So you can have multiple levels of the direction to get even more space. Yep. Do those entries provide virtual addresses or actual addresses? Which They're one? Like the page directory entry. So it's not virtual or physical address space per se, but it provides you the next level of indexes. But that's located somewhere. It's located somewhere. So, it it's so that, that depends on where you would like to uh, put this information. So it's possible to put this out of table in the physical address. It's also possible to put them in the virtual address here. It depends on how you would like to manage this. And there are trade-offs. So you can, you can put the remaining level in the virtual memory. Because the, the first level page table, the one that you actually have to access the the, uh, the physical memory, mm. that that has to be in the physical memory. 
the ref can be in the virtual memory. So is it possible to get deadlocks in terms of you're trying to get to this page table, but you need a page table to get to the page table? You need... So if it's in virtual memory, yeah. you need some sort of table to get there. So... But maybe that table is also in virtual memory. Then you have... What if you have... So are you saying, what if you have multiple page fault when you... What if you have a page fault when looking for the page table? Well, you then you grab that page from the disk, and then you that that is in the memory, so you can access that particular data. Yeah. And then oh, I have page fault again. You grab another uh, particular page uh, data in the memory in order to access the next level. Because, because this process is sequential. You you can search for this first. Yeah. Search for this letter. Yeah. And then search for this. So, so they but they can like cross-reference each other? Well, I mean, you don't have to, for this table's entry, you don't have to cross-reference and refer anything, like, get any information from here. <coughs> so once you're done with this, you can, I mean, this is just like a tiny piece of information. Once you get this data, it's just a few bits, right? Once, once you, you grab the page directory, you only have to grab this, this data. Yeah. So you can temporarily store this data, Oh, actually, you can do this in hardware, so it depends on how you implement this. Mm -hmm. But there's like a tiny amount of memory, I mean, a few yeah. bits. Then you grab the next level, append, it, append this data to the, the virtual address, grab the index into the virtual memory, I mean physical memory, bye bye, and then grab the actual data from the physical address. So it's possible to have multiple page fault. And hopefully that doesn't happen because OS should off it, but OS should handle that and make sure you don't have many page faults already. You try to look up some address. <coughs> but that sh there wouldn't be a deadlock. <coughs> and these base, uh, base register that you use to refer to the page directory is a part of the process context, similar to like PC or uh, other resource-based contexts that are involved for each of the processes. So this needs to be loaded when you have context switch. So for example, if you do uh, process number one, you're done with whatever you're doing, and then somehow you get context switch, you move, uh, you are now running process two on your machine. The, the best, register that you have that you use to access the page directory has to be changed. Well, now you have a different base uh, register and you use that information to grab the data from the physical memory. <coughs> so this is one of the example of the real world uh, processor that use multiple level of interaction and for this particular case, you are looking at 32-bit x86 machine. Within that 32-bit in x86, the specification is the first 10 bits is for the directory, and that need uh, that is used to look up the 20-bit <coughs> uh, information, and you can append with the next 10 bits to get the page table entry from the page table, and then the last 12 bits because there is 4 kilobyte page, and log phase 2 of 4K is 12 bits, so that's the offset of where exactly that physical address is, and you append the page, uh, the, what, whatever you get from page here for entry to get a 32 bit physical address. What did you have 64 bits machine? Oh, let, let, let's go over this first. Uh, what if you, you have a 4 megabyte page using 32 bit paging? Because now your page is 4 megabytes, you don't have to have that many, you don't have to, the, the space required to store all the page table entries are not that big anymore. So in x86, when you have large pages, you only can, you, you don't even have to use two levels of insertion. So you have the directory, which is 10 bits, you append it to the offset, uh, you append the, the page table entry to the offset to get the physical address which 
for, for each of the physical uh, page is four megabytes, physical frame four megabytes. And here is the uh, mapping of the x86 page table entries. This is one of the example of uh, the, the one of the mapping. And this is the format of what uh, each of the bit position are used for. Some of them are actually used for access control. Uh, some of them are for, for example, the user class supervisor bit. Those are used for uh, access control, which I will go over that on the next lecture. And then here's what uh, x x defined for each of the page directory entry. Zero and one is whether it's this entry is present or not. If it's not present, you have to grab the data somewhere on the disk. Read or write, and then user supervisor, these are access control, and there are other bits for optimization for some whether the page level cache is disabled or not. <coughs> and here, what did you have 64 bit address space? Now you can access a lot more data and your uh, linear address space, which each of the program sees are now much, much bigger. So what's happening here is you have four level interaction. First of all, you have the first level interaction access the index into the page directory table that points to another page directory. Over here to here, you append that information to the actual page table to get the page table entry, append it to the offset, and then I mean prepend it to the offset to get the actual physical address. And as you can see, this more or less linear process. So the OS or the software has to perform to some uh, management or optimization to make sure you do this efficiently. And one technique is your CLB. I'll, I'll go over that uh, on the next lecture. And here's like another excerpt from the x86. Uh, you can read that later after the slide if you want to get more information, including how this access, I mean, the, the each of the bits that, in addition to just the, the typical um, physical address or the physical actual data that you'd like to use to index to the next level is used for, for the page table entry and the page directory entry in x and x. And that's all in terms of the material today. Uh, let me go over some uh, sample problems. I just pulled it up right a few minutes ago. Here is a sample problem from 2013. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> all right, and you can take a look at this information. I'm going to ask you the actual question. First of all, how many bits are needed for the virtual address space? The, the virtual address space, not twenty. Twenty bits. Twenty. Uh, yes. What about the physical address space? <coughs> let me, actually, let me write the answer along the way. Anyone take more? We can work on it too. How many bits is the page uh, 
<coughs> Page table offset. It's pretty much the log phase to your those three numbers. When you are actually doing the question, make sure you use the same that correct number because this is the total bits you need. Can we answer in log phase two on the exam? Like yeah. one megabyte divided by <laughs> log phase two of Okay. That that's that's okay. Two to the ten is kilobytes. Two to the twenty is megabytes. Yeah, so 2 to the 30 would be another order gigabyte. So you can use that to get the actual number. Uh, we will probably give uh, some credit if you do log base 2. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna promise you that you get full credit because I'm not sure how the rubric is gonna break out. But if you can work out the actual number and it's divisible by two, I mean, if it's, if once you have the log of that number and it's a uh, like an, an, a number, not a data. It's an integer. <laughs> Sorry. You should be able to get that number, and you, we, we kind of expect you to get that full bit. And you you will probably need to use that information later. So you probably need to use this number 20, 18, and 12 later. Is it important to also know whether the memory is byte addressable or bit addressable? Uh, for this particular case? Yes. I'd right, because if the address, if you're bit addressable, you have to represent all the bits. But if it's byte addressable, you only have to represent. So that information can be important, depending on how you how we frame the question. Because in the end, we, what, what these number for is for indexing. If you need that uh, great, like fine grain index, indexes, you you need those like, additional bits. If not, you would you, you not. Yeah, but that would change the but, answer to this yeah, question. Yeah, uh, if it's byte addressable, depending on how you how you access that particular byte, right? Because sometimes it's specified in ISA that you don't have to specify the, the address that you have you, that you specified is in the word, and then you have some emotion on which byte in that particular word you want to access to. <coughs> And in general, if you do, if we do not specify anything by default, it's word addressable. Word addressable. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next question, and we use this information. I'm gonna write the question down. Uh, get me the VPN and the physical address, given this information, and the virtual address is fifteen to thirteen. Just because they exist in this table. Virtual okay. address is OX. And I will write the actual bit view for, like, in bin binary for that number. It's The red are zero in the front. So this is not 32 bit. You okay. have to pretend zero. The first hex is one, right? So it's zero, 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 one. Zero. I mean, there, yeah, zero is not zero. Just pre prepend the zero before. Oh, yeah, it's easy All to see the, the, set, the total bits. If you're pulling out like, specific numbers, of bits. That's true. Uh, let me check. Yeah, so it's one and five minus two, one, three. So Yeah. No no, it's just the point like flipping, sorry. Yeah. Uh I mean that that's one of the techniques that you can translate hex to binary easily. Just divide everything into a four bit chunk and then just translate each individual of these entries into a uh, binary. 
Are we supposed to use the TLB? Uh, yeah. right now let's assume this. Actually, that's true. <laughs> yeah. You will yeah. have to use a TLB in this case. Because there's, yeah. There's yeah. There's more. <laughs> Right. Okay, that's not the ideal uh, practice question, but <laughs> since you guys to took the scene before... No, <laughs> can do the first part then. Okay. I'll, I'm gonna give the TLB index and TLB tag. Uh, TLB index would be TLB tell you whether you have a page. Uh, one, one thing you can use for the TLB is <laughs> even the tag and index, uh, you get the physical page number Wait. and check whether it's valid or not. But you said the index is 2. Yes. And the tag is 5. That's just not in 2. It's page fault. Oh. Page fault. Yeah. Okay. But then, even though it's page fault, you can get the physical address. Well, you have to go to this. You go to this. So then we can't tell you. Or oh. Because what's the... Well, the disk has to tell you. Like, you have to load the... You can get that basically to the page table, what it's from. Oh, you don't go to disk, you go to... No, why not? You okay, refer to the page table. You, you can... You... Okay. It's not the page fault, my bad. But it's a miss in the field of the entry. Okay. Yes. Oh, there you go. So you, you cannot use the TLB to get the physical page number, but you can walk the page table to get the physical address. Using the rest. It's one by binary, so yeah. it's not zero. Uh, yes, so it should be one B, and that is. TLB. I mean, you can do that, but I'll go over TLB in the next uh, lecture. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I guess since we have it here, why not? Uh, what if these bits are your one? Yeah. So they become. Um. 
let's assume because I haven't really gone over GLB yet, the index would be index two. Now it's a TOP hit. So it's <coughs> the PPN on the TLB. Yep. So it's yeah. one half. A lot simpler. Now you have a zero one it's followed by the phase offset. Everything is easy. You just look at the TLB append the offset. You don't even have to access the page table. Yeah. So in the second case you have zero one and then So as you can see here, if you have a TLB, which you can store it anywhere in the memory, what if you have that in the cache? You can access them really fast. And then, because you have information on what's the physical page number, you just grab that number, append it with the, the page offset, and you get a physical address. Now you skip the whole process of walking the page table, which can be longer and then just grab that data in the, phys uh, the, the physical memory. So I'm gonna explain TLB in, uh, in, in a much more detail than how you get the indices and also the tag in the next lecture. Yeah. If you had directories and just many more layers, would the TLB always point to the PPN or would it just point to the next, so next layer of indirection, which would be more efficient, I guess? That, that That's a trade-off trade -off over there because First of all, if you have more level entries, it means that you have many, many, many more pages, right? Your virtual address is huge. If you have, if you point in the TLB entry, you point a physical page number, which most of the case it is, you have to have a bigger TLB. Mm -hmm. And the definition of how big it is doesn't really depending on the size of your virtual memory. It depends on what the the system designer would like the TLB entry to be, depending, I guess, depending on what you're running, depending on your machine, what's the size of the physical memory, and what's the latency you need to access those physical memory as well as access the disk. So the, the, the bigger TLB, you waste some of the cache, because these things typically are being stored in the cache, because those, those are fast, and you can grab them really quickly in order to get, get the physical address. <coughs> but cache is a lot more expensive because they are SRAM cells, not DRAM. And a few megabytes of cache would cost a lot more money. Uh, but if you start a PPN only, it's easy. You can just grab the PPN, get the actual uh, physical address in DRAM. If you have another level, then you have to access DRAM in order to grab that page table entry, in order to grab the physical address. So you have one additional memory request. Mm -hmm. That's a trade-off there. Uh, depending on how you design it, most of the case TLB is stored in PPN okay. in order to make sure you optimize for latency. And I mean, when you have the physical address, sometimes it's actually hidden in the cache, so you don't have to access it. Because data in the in the physical address space, sometimes uh, they are stored in the cache. So pretty much you access the cache, and you just access the cache again in order to grab that data. You don't have to actually go to memory at all. Like what if if you have another interaction in the TLB, then you have to maybe access the memory and then access the cache. Now you have a lot incur a longer, much longer latency. Uh, any other questions? <coughs> Right. So today we went over some uh, functionalities of the virtual memory and how to uh, translate the virtual memory to the physical virtual address to the physical address and go over some practice questions. Next time I'm gonna I'm I'm going to go over how TLB works. Also, how do you, what are the security and also permission access control that virtual memory can allow you to to be able to do. And also have another practice question with a multi-level uh, uh, page table, so you can get some more practice. And hopefully that helps you guys understand virtual memory some more. And if you have any question, including questions, 
already have from Twitter Hint, feel free to ask them via the and you answer uh, any of your questions. Right? And make sure you work on pipelining. It's a long lab. Yeah. Yeah. At least make sure you get the design up and figure out whether you have a bug or not. Because debugging in this lab can be long, longer than the, the last one. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. <laughs> 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 <laughs>